Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of Women's Voice. My name is Sarah Furry. Today, we've moved out of the studios and we've pitched our tent at the Moving Pick Ambassadors Hotel in Accra here because today we want to delve into uh, a life that I would describe as very, very brave, very, very courageous. Today, we want to have a sneak peek into uh, a very beautiful woman's life. Her name is uh, Miss Omotola Thomas. Omotola lives and is surviving with Parkinson's disease. And I must say that she is a heroine. And anyone who listens to her would agree with me. We are told that the prevalence of Parkinson's disease in Ghana Although we don't have the data, but it's been estimated that about 12% of the patients seen at the hospitals have Parkinson's disease. That's really quite worrying. And although data is not current, we are also told that there are only 12 neurologists in Ghana attending to other neurological conditions, including Parkinson's disease. Today I have with me, besides Omotala uh, Thomas, uh, Dr. Vaida Obese. She is a specialist physician at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital in Kumasi. And guess what? She's also passionate about Parkinson's disease. She's even running a foundation called the Enidaso Parkinson's Foundation that attends to uh, cases to support such patients, access medication and treatment services. Welcome to our studios, ladies. I must say you Thank look you. stunning in your various capacities. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. All right. So, Omotala, can you share with us uh, how life was like for you uh, before you were diagnosed? Thank you very much for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your show. Um, before I got Parkinson's, I, I, I was born and raised in Nigeria. I grew up there, lived there for about 20 years before I moved to the U.S. to study. Um, I got my bachelor's, my master's, got married, had children. Um, I was working as an engineer at a company in, at a construction company in the U.S. Um, I would say I lived a, an average life, you know, the average life of a busy, busy working wife and mother, um, two young kids. Um, yeah, it was, I think, pretty normal. Life was beautiful, I must say. Life was beautiful and still is. It is, okay. So for the purposes of our viewers who do not understand what Parkinson's disease is, Dr. Bessie, why don't you give us some definitions? Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease that affects the brain. So there's a part of your brain that's known as the basal ganglia that controls movement. And this part of the brain requires a chemical known as dopamine. And so what happens in Parkinson's disease is that these cells that produce this chemical, these chemicals, for some reason die off and cannot produce that dopamine. And when you don't have that dopamine, you cannot move. And so that's what happens with these patients. And, um, and so with the disease, you, you tend to become slow and you tend to have issues with your posture the muscles are very rigid, and some of the patients have their posture unstable. And so everything that has to do with movement is difficult. Even food moving through your mouth down, constipation, because it requires movement, you know. And so, and it's not only movement that is affected in these patients. These patients also have to battle with anxiety, depression, sleepless nights and so many other things. So it's a very difficult disease to have. Okay. But do we know the risk factors? What causes it? So for now, more than 77% of the time, we do not know what causes Parkinson's disease. But we know that at least around 26% is caused by genetic, something in our genetic makeup. So we are strongly believing that it's an interplay between the environment and genetics that causes the disease. But exactly what starts the damage that leads to these cells dying off and not producing dopamine, for now we do not know. And um, for Ghana, we are now building a registry and researching as to what in our environment puts us at risk. But for now, worldwide, we don't even know what causes it. Okay. So let's say if someone 
um, is a Caucasian and um, a black person having Parkinson's, uh, do they present the same? So wherever you are in this world, Parkinson's affects people differently. So even when you take 10 people in Ghana, they will have different ways of presenting. So some will come with very bad tremors. Some don't have tremor. The issue is their muscles are stiff. They can't get out of bed. They can't um, move around. And they tend to freeze a lot. So they try to cross the road, and their foot is stuck to the ground. They want to move, but they cannot move. Okay. And then for some, they come with a very bad tremors. So let me come to Motila. Um, you just described to us how life was beautiful and is still beautiful prior to your discovery of uh, Parkinson's. But tell us, at the beginning stages, what did you notice? So my first symptoms started that I recognized started in 2009. I was 29 at the time. And it started with a slight twitch in the forefinger on this hand. And um, I thought it was due to stress. It was a, it was you know, it's not that it was a busy period in my life. I was working as an engineer. My drive to work was 60 kilometers one way. Uh, two young children, so uh, you know, family wedding. I just chalked it up to stress. And uh, eventually, the tremors got worse. Um, and then I went to see a doctor, and you know, he took you know, he assessed me, and he said, "You don't have anything to worry about. This is just essential tremors." Um, and I thought that, you know, I could relax, you know, but over time the tremors got worse and then it became accompanied by muscle rigidity, muscle stiffness, weakness, fatigue, pain, apathy, depression, anxiety. Uh, this, you know, my handwriting became smaller, I lost my sense of smell um, and it was just one symptom after another and it was really, really difficult. Um, because you literally feel like your body is falling apart into pieces and you don't know what the reason is. But at least when I eventually got diagnosed, which took five to six years, I now understood that, okay, instead of these 20 something symptoms that I'm experiencing um, and wondering what's causing them, they, I, I finally had a name uh, that I could put all of those, like an umbrella name that I could put all those symptoms under and I knew that what I was dealing with was, in fact, one thing with many different symptoms, which was Parkinson's disease. Okay. So when you said it started with just a twitching of your forefinger, between which period, I mean, as the time progressed, um, did it uh, move to probably another finger or the whole hand? And at what point were you worried to seek help? So it's a very slow process. Um, I think it started 2009, um, and for the next two to three years, it got gradually worse. And at the beginning, I could look at my hand shaking or twitching, and my, my brain, I could tell it, stop it, and it'll stop. Um, so the point I started getting worried was when I slowly started losing the ability to control the tremors, you know, to be able to tell my brain, stop. Um, when the, the, one of the first things that I thought that came to my mind when I noticed the shaking was Muhammad Ali because I remembered the 1996 Olympics where he was carrying the torch and his hands were shaking so the first thing that came to my mind was actually Parkinson's disease but I tell you I never ever voiced it to anybody not my immediate family not my doctors because I was afraid I was afraid that if I used my mouth to say this is Parkinson's and that would, that, you know, it will become my reality. Okay. Uh, but it took a while before anybody even suggested that I had Parkinson's Are you superstitious or, superstitious or that religious to think that probably if you had said that it was Parkinson's, you were going to have it? I, I wouldn't say I'm superstitious. Um, I am Christian. Um, and I think I, I, you know, we grew up believing or being taught that, you know, what you say becomes your reality. Yeah. Um, and I was too afraid to even contemplate having Parkinson's mm. disease. Mm. Okay. I'll come back to you to tell me whether at the time you knew anything apart from probably what you had seen with Muhammad Ali, uh, whether you knew anything about Parkinson's, you had, been, or you probably, it, it's, 
made you in, it's intrigued your your mind enough to probably want to read about it to find out more about it L let me just let you uh, take some respite and come to uh, dr Bisi. dr Bisi, uh, listening to um, omotola she probably cited all the signs and symptoms that you had mentioned earlier and it's it came gradually um, I want to find out from you how easily diagnosable is Parkinson's? So we believe that Parkinson's disease starts with the symptoms not related to movement. All right, so it probably starts, you realize your handwriting is becoming smaller and smaller. Your voice is becoming softer and softer. Um, when you ask most patients, they probably had anxiety constipation, depression, restlessness, um, terrible dreams at night, long before they started having issues with movement. And so these, you can't easily say because somebody is unsure, the person has Parkinson's. So definitely it will become a problem when you start showing things that have to do with movement. And so for countries like the US, there's a long research ongoing, prospectively following people up with these symptoms, so if you complained of loss of smell, which used to be one of the earlier signs of Parkinson's, you were now put into that registry and followed up to see if you are going to develop anything of that sort. But now with COVID, it's difficult to say that somebody with um, loss of smell can get Parkinson's. Okay. And even with the genetics, you could have a gene that has been linked to Parkinson's and never develop the disease. And so it's a very intriguing disease that the world is yet to understand. She said it took her about five years before it was finally diagnosed as Parkinson's. I found that interesting because that is the case with our side of the world. It takes years to diagnose uh, a non-communicable disease it, because I don't know whether it's the frontliner issue or not, but she lives in an advanced country like the UK. It, does it take does it beat the doctor's mind, you know, to, to be able to easily diagnose it? Because it took her five years. So I guess she may tell the story of why it took that long okay. to be diagnosed. But I think one of her problems was that, well, was her age. I mean, the age group that you usually see Parkinson's disease in is the above 60 year group. And so most of the doctors were saying, no, you are too young to have Parkinson's. Okay. And that's what we are now seeing in our part of the world. We know most of our patients are above 60, they are elderly, and people tend to associate being slow with aging. Just old, that's why he's stooped. He's always old, that's why he's slow. Um, okay, it could be stroke because it starts on one side of the body, so it's probably stroke. And that's why sometimes it beats the mind of some people. But I guess over the years, there's been a lot of education, a lot of breakthroughs in the disease and people are beginning to understand that being slow is not equal to aging and um, we are seeing a lot of patients below 50 years and for you to be diagnosed below 50 it means you're a young person mm -hmm. coming up with an elderly person's disease mm -hmm. and so that brings the question of why are we seeing younger people now exhibiting the disease of the old mm -hmm. and so research is needed to really figure it out okay. what in our environment that is putting us at our risk okay so Omotala, how come it took them five years she mentioned your aid but are there any other reasons for which reason it delayed in being diagnosed yes i mean the first leg of my journey took three years when we were in the u.s which in and of itself is a long time and then we moved to South Africa, and that took another two years. But, you know, what she said, what well, Dr. Obese said is correct. I think the last doctor in South Africa before I came to the UK, which is where I got diagnosed, he said something to me. He was the first doctor that ever mentioned Parkinson's five years after my symptoms started. He said, I think you have a form of Parkinsonism, but it's difficult for me to diagnose you with that because of your race, your age, and your gender. You are a young black female, and we typically see this disease presenting old white males. Um, so I, I, that, that's, I, I think those, those are the factors that contributed to it taking quite a long time okay. for me. Okay. 
So, Dr. Bese, is, I mean, I'm sure people will be wondering by now, is Parkinson's contagious? Is it um, <laughs> um, genetic? What does it tell us about it? So, Parkinson's disease is not contagious. Um, what, as I mentioned earlier, over 26% is attributed to genetics. Something, and those patients tend to present earlier. If something in your genetic makeup puts you at risk of that, you, you tend to show up early. But um, it's not transferable. But having a relative, a close, a first degree relative with the disease puts you at two times risk, as opposed to somebody with no relative having Parkinson's disease. And that is why, as a nation, and as Africans, we need to pay more attention to research of our diseases. Mm -hmm. We need to collect our own data okay. to analyze why things, certain things happen and why are certain things peculiar to us. Mm. And um, I think we are getting there. Okay. And as a foundation, the Nidaso Parkinson Disease Foundation, we are collaborating with researchers in the UK and in the US to talk about this. And we've already started a genetic study to find out why Ghanaians get Parkinson's disease. So hopefully with funding and with progress, we'll be able to have answers in the next two years. Okay. Speaking about immediate families, how did you bring this news to them? How did they take it? What sort of support have you gotten from them? So I'd like to start by saying a lot of the work that I am doing uh, that I have done and that I will continue to do would not be possible without the love, the support and the care that I receive from my immediate and my extended family. My husband, my children, my parents, friends, siblings, uh, they have all come together literally and rallied around me and afforded me the opportunity to be able to do what I do. When I got diagnosed I was alone. My husband was back in South Africa with the children and I came to England by myself um, and obviously he knew immediately um, but I think for the two of us because this had been such a long journey five over five years we were not happy that it was Parkinson's but we were relieved to finally have a name an umbrella term to bring all these other symptoms under for our children uh, we took I mean they, they, they were they knew they could see my tremors they could see that you know my hands were shaking and this wasn't normal so they already knew that there was an issue they just didn't know the name so we told them I mean my son was I think 10 at the 10 and my daughter was 7 uh, and so we just told them in the, in the way that we could explain to kids that this is why my hands are shaking there's an illness called Parkinson's disease it's manageable it's you know you can you know you can use medication to make it better and that was it my mom and my dad, I didn't tell for a long time um, because I knew that it would be very, very difficult for them. Um, I told my siblings almost immediately uh, and it was very tough. It was tough. Um, so tough that I almost had to be consoling them at the onset initially because, it's, because it's hard. You yeah, know, your so child is telling you that they have this long-term chronic neurodegenerative disease. It was very difficult. But um, I'm grateful that, you know, over time I've been able to manage and live as well as I can with the illness. And they see that and they are encouraged by that. Okay. So you, you told me at the beginning that you were an engineer. Yes. You have a family, a beautiful family. You used to do, uh, maybe you used to cook for them. You used to probably uh, play with them or braid your child's hair. I believe you used to do things for them. Um, tell me how hard it has been to even accept the fact that all these things that you used to enjoy doing are no more. It was very, very, very difficult and for a long time I couldn't even talk about the loss I experienced of braiding my daughter's hair without getting emotional and without getting upset for a number of reasons. Number one, it was a bonding experience between her and myself. I loved it. We used to have, that was our move. We used to just spend time together doing that. Um, and then secondly, I now got to a position where, I, a place where I had to depend on other people to do it. And that was really, really difficult uh, for me, not being able to make food, 
um, for my family, uh, not being able to attend my children's school activities. Um, I can still drive, but I can't drive long and far distances. Um, I get tired mentally and physically. Uh, so even if I'm not tired physically, like mentally, sometimes I'm drained and I cannot, I cannot keep up at the pace that I used to. And that is, that is very, very challenging as a mom. Um, it's very challenging. Mm. Sometimes I, I get overwhelmed by uh, the stories people tell us, but that's your reality and we share in it. Um, let me come to Dr. Uh, Obese. I want to find out from you. Uh, she's just telling me the things she's unable to do and how much it, it has affected her. Um, when such patients come to you, what do you tell them? It depends on, I always, tell other doctors the journey that um, patients go through from diagnosis throughout ex their experience and it's very difficult and most of them will obviously be in denial before they accept it and so we always break the news in a very you know compassionate manner usually I ask who brought the pain of the patient for the person to be there and before you break the news of the disease. Mm. And we try to educate them about it well enough or your first visit before you leave. Mm. So you don't go home with all sorts of funny ideas. Mm. But sometimes they are, they are advanced and you need to tell them the truth that is a progressive illness. Mm. And so as Omotola said, it, it was just a twitch and then over time it became worse. And it will become worse at a point, but um, we always make them aware that foundations like ours are there, clinicians are there for them, and there are a huge number of patients just like them, and so you are never alone to live that journey by yourself. Mm. And so it's not easy to talk about it, but um, I think as a physician, you should be bold to tell them the truth. Sometimes um, patients would not want to hear bad news and would would take things the way they want okay. to see it okay. but you try your best to pass on the best way you can okay. and always make sure there are avenues for them to ask more questions there are avenues for them to vent out their frustrations mm -hmm. and that is what is lacking in our some of our hospitals we are overworked and um, you have four or five doctors seeing over 100 patients so sometimes it's difficult to make that time. Mm. But as a foundation, wherever our presence is, we have a team of health workers mm -hmm. whose numbers are on speed dial mm -hmm. for these patients mm -hmm. to share um, their frustrations mm -hmm. and their questions. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Can I say something? Go ahead, um, I, you know, for I think the biggest thing for me and the most challenging thing was I didn't feel like I was enough. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I didn't just losing slowly losing the ability to do many things and watching other parents, other mothers do these things for their children was really really difficult. And even though I am fortunate, I had the love and the support of my family that they didn't put an extra burden on me. It was that that feeling of inadequacy was terribly challenging mm. and I'm hoping that other people who are watching this who feel that way should know that they are enough. Okay. I, 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 I can't imagine the psychological burden it, this disease places on you but I want you to tell me what do you miss most? What do you miss doing most? One of my biggest challenges uh, is something that people cannot see um, I experience cognitive difficulties um, and doing interviews like these, it doesn't matter how many times I've done them, they're very scary because I don't know when my brain would feel freeze and I may not find the words to be able to articulate what I'm trying to say. I miss the fluid way in which I was able to communicate and express myself freely mm. in the past and you know it has it has become considerably more difficult for mm. me. Mm. Okay.
Okay. So you were telling us, I, obviously I see the tremors, and now you're telling us sometimes you have freezing uh, of, of your brain and all that. What other symptoms do you have? Um, there's bradykinesia, which is slowed movement. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's muscle stiffness and rigidity. Um, I think uh, one of the more difficult ones uh, is pain. People cannot see that you're experiencing physical pain, mm -hmm. and I experience that quite a bit. Um, and in terms of the non-motor symptoms, other than the shaking, um, I, I go through periods of anxiety. There was a time, I'm thankful that this has not, I mean, and I think this hasn't happened recently, with, I went through a period of severe depression, um, very, 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 very difficult and uh, yeah, very challenging. Mm. But people don't see these things, people don't, and what people can't see, it's very difficult for people to un understand. Mm. Like my hands are shaking, so if I want to carry a cup, people can help me and say, oh, can I help you with that? Um, but when I'm experiencing anxiety or depression, people can't see it or, you know, mental fatigue. Uh, so it's like, so, you know, people are wondering, why didn't you just organize this better? Why didn't you just do this? But they can't see mm -hmm. inside my brain that I don't have enough dopamine to be able to do these things that seem normal to most other people. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that makes you feel... Um inadequate as yeah, exactly. you, 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 you early on. Exactly. <coughs> so Dr. Obese, um, obviously you said this is chronic, but let's talk about the management. How do you manage Parkinson's? So the management of Parkinson's disease um, is a multidisciplinary one, meaning that it's not only a doctor, you need a nurse, a nutritionist, occupational therapist, pharmacist, a whole band of people to help you go through it and so the doctor will take care of the medical component any medication you need to be able to move so for movement you have medication you get depressed there's medication for that anxiety there's medication for that and so there's no cure but there is um, treatment to support any other symptom that shows okay. up and um, the nutritionist will guide you into what to eat because they suffer from constipation a lot. And yes, occupational therapist would help you adjust at home because for some patients, you need to install certain things in the house to help them bath, to help them move about without people's help. Mm -hmm. And workplace, we have to educate their workplaces to some, if for example, you were the one signing checks, maybe you will not be able to sign checks anymore because your hand is shaking, but it can give you other jobs that you can do with, without sacking you from work. Mm. And yes, so those but are But does the it happen, the, the symptoms or the signs, does it um, happen all the time or there, sh there are sometimes maybe triggers that contribute to that? So typically the drugs for, that help you move, you have to take it as often as possible. Once it stop, it's not enough in your body, you need another dose. And so those periods you become slow again. Okay. And um, yeah you would need to be on constant um, treatment. Okay, so you mentioned that it is multidisciplinary. You mentioned occupational therapist, nutritionist. I'm sure she would also, or such patients would also need psychologists. We and do all have, that. So, yes. So who else are, are they supposed to see? Yeah, they're supposed to see a psychologist to talk about all those anxieties and depression, which is not talked about in Ghana here because we are a bit conservative about um, spilling your issues out and men most of the time will be shy to talk about all the other things some are married have i mean um, erectile dysfunction women have low libido even the disease breaks you down makes you feel you're not enough mm. and so there are issues there's a whole spectrum of i mean symptoms and issues that we cannot solve as i mean doctors of which a psychologist can help, of which there are some patients that have issues with swallowing. So we need a speech and language therapist. And we need most of those therapists in Ghana. They are not a lot. Mm -hmm. And so for patients who are in our hospitals, we always make them aware that these services are available for them mm -hmm. and anytime they need it. But as a doctor, anytime you see a patient, even strokes, 
we have a lot of people who have strokes and are depressed. Mm. So at every visit, you should be mindful of the fact that um, these chronic illnesses have a huge burden on families and on the patient and be curious enough to know if the patient is experiencing it okay. and direct the patient to the appropriate person to manage. Okay. Omotola, so let me ask you, are there things you can do for yourself? Are you still in a, uh, working as an engineer or you are now back at home? And what are the things you can do for yourself? I'm very glad you asked that question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about my foundation, Parkinson's Africa. But um, I can, I'm thankful that I can still do pretty much everything that I was able to do, just not at the same pace and not for the same period of time. So I can drive, I can cook, I walk, I exercise um, at a reduced rate, at a reduced pace and at a reduced intensity. Um, I, I'm not working as an engineer anymore. Um, Which kind of engineer? Where you? It was, I was working in civil engineering okay. as, a, as, an, as a, okay. in the construction okay. industry. Wow. Um, actually, let me say that again. I was working in a construction, in, in a construction company as a cost engineer, okay. but we had to do some civil engineering yeah. work as well. Yeah. Um, so now, what do I do now? I am the founder and director of Parkinson's Africa. I established Parkinson's Africa shortly uh, two years ago, uh, about two years ago, but the idea and the inspiration for establishing the foundation, um, the charity, came after I got diagnosed. I was in the UK, had access to all this multidisciplinary care she's talking about, um, anything I, you know, had access to medication, to treatment, but I was still struggling, you know, and I felt like, you know, if I was in the UK with access to everything that I needed, if I was still struggling, then I I couldn't imagine what life would be like for people who were back home in Nigeria or in other parts of Africa living with an illness like this without access to the same thing. So that inspired me. And then I also felt very alone. I didn't feel like there were enough services for Africans, enough supports and services, support services for Africans. Um, and I, and I, wanted, I didn't want other people who would come after me and get diagnosed to feel the same way that I did. Mm. And so I established Parkinson's Africa uh, almost two years ago. Parkinson's Africa is a registered charity in the UK and in Nigeria. And all we're trying to do is to support and empower Africans impacted by Parkinson's disease. And we do that through collaborations with foundations like Dr. Obese's Inida So Parkinson's Disease Foundation. We have other organizations that we're supporting and working with in different parts of Africa, in Uganda, Kenya, Cameroon, Ethiopia, South Africa, Nigeria. And what we want to do is to create a platform where all of us can come together, unite and strengthen our voices, and, and champion the cause of Africans impacted by Parkinson's disease. We try to raise awareness um, and um, increase the level of understanding, and, or, and, uh, of, understanding of Parkinson's disease. You're holding a booklet that we co-produced with um, the IPDGC Africa, um, and we also support patients who don't have access or who cannot afford their medication. Indeed, God bless your beautiful heart for trying to uh, bring down the services you access down to uh, your folks back home. Dr. Bessie, speaking of awareness, how much do we know as Ghanaians or as blacks about the disease? How much of a burden is it to a typical family who has it? So the knowledge of Parkinson's disease is very low in Ghana. Um, we are trying our best using the media, just like this interview, um, working in communities to explain that slowness is not equal to aging, and letting people understand what to look out for, where to get help, and that there is treatment. Mm. And so the foundation has been working um, tirelessly on that account. We've trained clinicians, um, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other people to understand the disease better and to be able to pick them up early. For the part of being a burden to families, I think whenever people are thinking about costs, we always talk about cost of medication. 
um, the medicines are not, in the, are not on the insurance, and most of our patients are elderly and already have chronic illnesses, hypertension, diabetes, and the rest to manage. And so having to buy the Parkinson's disease drugs is not easy for these patients. Mm. And mind you, if they are the breadwinners, they cannot work. So how do the families manage? How do they take care of their children, their education? It's really a big issue. And when they get sick, the burden in our hospitals, how do we pay for their care? Mm. So the economic burden is large. And I always tell people wherever I meet them that we all have an elderly person in our home. We are all growing older by the day. And so it's about time that, although, you know, in our country we have, or in Africa, we are grappled with infectious diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV is killing so many people. And so attention is not a non-communicable disease. Now that we are aging more, we are seeing more of these um, diseases associated with the aged, and so we should now pay attention to non-communicable diseases of which Parkinson's disease is part, and stakeholders have to come together to see how best we can make their medication more accessible, mm. make the burden on the patient and the caregivers more light. Mm. If you just tuned in, this is still Women's Voice, and today we are talking about Parkinson's disease, uh, the burden it bears on family we have in the studio, a very beautiful lady with a beautiful heart who is braving through Parkinson's disease and I bet you she's doing very good at that. But we also have someone who is driving home the awareness of uh, Parkinson's disease back here in Africa. He's uh, a, British, a former British war veteran. His name is Guy Dickens and he's decided to take it upon himself to embark on a campaign from Sierra Leone all the way down to South Africa to drum home uh, the awareness on the disease and to get the required attention by policymakers. Let's take a look at his clip. I've got Parkinson's and I was diagnosed in 2011 but before that I was in the army as a soldier and I had a full career as an army officer in the British Army serving all over the world, doing the things that normal people do. And in 2010, I was deployed to the Congo, which was wonderful, and I enjoyed every bit of it. And I came back very tired, very exhausted, and I just thought I was worn out. In fact, I had some of the symptoms of Parkinson's, but didn't recognize them, didn't know what to look for. But when I returned to the UK, the doctor said very quickly, you must go and see a neurologist. And he very quickly just, just diagnosed with Parkinson's there and then. In retrospect, of course, it's very obvious, but at the time I didn't know at all, and it was a complete shock. And I didn't know what would happen to me after that. But I was still remained in the army for the next 10 years or so. They paid me my normal wage, and I could carry on living a normal life until 2019. In 2019, I had already planned many years beforehand to set off on a journey from England to, to Cape Town to travel through Africa. I've traveled as a young man many times to the Sahara. I've been to East Africa a bit, I've been to Southern Africa, but I've never been to West Africa, and I was very keen to see it. So I made it my dream all those years ago to drive the route along the Atlantic coast, down through Sierra Leone, and eventually past Ghana, Nigeria, and beyond. And that was going to be my dream. And I wasn't going to let Parkinson stop me doing it, because although it was difficult, it was still possible to do these things. I was at a fairly early stage. And so I spent from November 19 until April 20 traveling through until COVID struck and I had to return back to England. I left my vehicle in, in Freetown, flew back to England and waited and waited and waited. We all thought COVID would be a short period of time, but two years later, eventually I could return. At that point, or between, in those two years, I was lucky enough to refine what I was trying to do. When I set off on the trip originally, I was determined to prove to people that Parkinson's does not have to stop you doing what you want to do. But I also want to show people what it's like to live with Parkinson's and some of the detail about it, because it's not all physical, as you'll hear later. But I met up with Omotola and learned about some of the issues and stories about Parkinson's in Africa, which is completely new to me. There was no reason that I should have been surprised, but I was surprised because I was very myopic. I knew about North America, I knew about Europe, but I didn't really think about the problems in Africa and what needs to happen here. 
it's not just the physical aspects of Parkinson's that people are aware of. The person who know a bit about it know about what it's like to shake or to dribble or to get dressed slowly or to shuffle around or to have difficulty eating. All those things are really obvious. What people don't know so much about is the mental side of it as well. Because, of course, dopamine is important for mental health, not just physical health. And therefore, I'm going to be very honest, and I have been very honest in my blog and my notes and the film that's going to be made about this journey, saying what it's really like. So people understand that those people who've got Parkinson's are suffering quite a lot more, suffering is the wrong word, are coping with quite a lot more than it looks like. They're not just tired, they're wrestling with all sorts of different tasks and different emotions and different things to do, and life is significantly more difficult for them. And I want to draw attention to that so that when people look at somebody with Parkinson's, they, just, they don't just think, there's a chap shuffling around having difficulty, or a girl having difficulty, they understand that person's having a real problem, and a real battle. So that's been the aim of my game. And I've travelled in a VW camper van, travelling by myself largely, which I'm always going to do, which has allowed me greater access to people, to meet people, and people have been very friendly and very helpful. And that's accompanied all the way around to Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, where I had some major technical problems. But even then, in the trouble and tr problems that I've had along the way, I have found the most inspiringly helpful, good, friendly people who've looked after me. In every country I've been through, I've been totally impressed by the care that people show to me once they know that I'm not entirely as healthy as I should be. People have understood that I need help, and because I've been honest enough to accept it, I've met some wonderful people. And that's really my story so far. It's got a long way to go. I've got to continue yet all the way down to South Africa. And that'll get, that's going to be difficult because I've discovered that it's much more difficult than I've realized. So we'll come back from the break. We just previewed a clip by uh, Mr. Guy Dickens, who is a former uh, British war veteran, who also lives with Parkinson's disease and a champion and advocate for the disease. And he's doing all he can uh, with his strength to uh, drum home uh, Parkinson's disease and and believe you me although he also has his crisis moments and all that he says he won't be deterred let's come back to uh, our guest here at the moving pick ambassadors hotel uh, we've been speaking to Miss Omotola Thomas and Dr. Uh, Vida Obese, who is also a specialist physician at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. You're welcome back from the break. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about how people see you. Have you had uh, a moment in your life where you probably felt like hiding from the public or your family probably couldn't present you? They may support you at home, but did, was it? much of a burden for them to even show you out there or even yourself going out there to present yourself to the world? For me, uh, almost immediately, uh, almost immediately after getting diagnosed, I knew that I wanted to speak openly about this illness. I felt like silence equaled subjugation. I felt like being silent meant the disease would win, that the disease would, you know, would have the upper hand and I felt like by speaking out I could take control of my situation or at least take control of the narrative of my situation and tell the story the way that I wanted it to be told as opposed to Parkinson's disease doing that. Uh, so I didn't have any issues with it. My extended family um, understandably had some issues because culturally, at least in Nigeria, we don't speak about these things. If you get a promotion at work or you buy a new car or something great happens oh yes please let's stand on the, the podium whole village must know <laughs> exactly and let's announce this and talk about how successful and how great our lives are mm -hmm. but when you have a sickness like parkinson's disease particularly one that is highly stigmatized and causes weird symptoms like shaking and tre and rigidity um it's, it's, you know, people, people, people don't know how to deal with that. And so some members of my extended family were not very happy that I was speaking publicly about it. Um, because what happens is 
when you hear that, oh, I'm also has Parkinson's, then somebody is calling my grandmother or calling my auntie, hey, I'm so sorry. Then they start to cry. And the people, <coughs> excuse me. Are they me, even genuine about it when they cry? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but the people that they are calling that were fine before, they now start to get anxious and worried. Uh, so um, I, it, took, it took a while for some people to be comfortable enough with my illness. But because of the work I do now, most people are comfort comfortable with it because they see that I'm helping us, I'm trying to help other people. Um, and I've been I'm very fortunate to have the platform that I do with Parkinson's Africa. But my concern is that not everybody is going to have a platform like Parkinson's Africa. So whether or not you know, their story ends up that way, people should be allowed to speak about their illness however they want, I think. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, let me let you rest a bit. Let's talk about Ghana or maybe Africa side of the world. How do people treat persons with Parkinson's disease? I have um, a bag full of stories about that from my patients. But the first reaction of people typically in banks is that they are drunk. When you try to cross the road, you know, everybody is busy going somewhere. So if your foot is stuck in traffic, you shouldn't be crossing the road anyway. And so people honk at them. Most of my patients are anxious about going into public, going to funerals, going into events, because they get anxious and then they start to shake more. Stressful environments worsen their tremors and then um, people start questioning it. And um, for husbands and wives, um, most people don't want their other people to know that their spouse has a problem. Mm. And I know of families where they don't want patients to come out because it will be, it's an evil thing and it will be associated with their families. So if someone, someone wants to marry into the family or someone is talking about the family somewhere, he'll say this family, they have a very bad disease and people who marry into it or who go into that home would have it. So stigma and so the at stigma, its highest it's, peak. <laughs> it's at its peak. And what worries me sometimes is when people, I assume, are learned, um, have schooled a bit and have seen life also doing the same thing. It makes it difficult. So sometimes I believe it's not even about education, it's our attitude as Africans and as Ghanaians, our reaction to these things. And, and with time, we have to change. Mm because it could happen to anybody, and it could happen to your family member, and then what? Okay. And I remember I went to a, um, an office to solicit for funds with my team, and I was the last to get there because I was on the phone. And so the boys entered the office, and when I got there and I knocked and I entered, the man sacked me. He didn't know who I was. Um, at least in Ghana, people respect doctors. <laughs> but he didn't know who I was, and he sucked me. He said he doesn't like women badging it. Women have to, you know, women have their space, and he just sucked me out of his office. I, I didn't mind. I always try to find reasons why people do certain things. So I told myself maybe I had a rough day, or I had something, and after they spoke to me, we left. And as fate will have it, six months later, I was seeing a patient in the consulting room who had just diagnosed of Parkinson's disease. And I asked that before I spoke to her about what was wrong with her, I needed a husband. And there was this man walking in wow. into the consulting room. And it was the same man who sat me. And we had been there to tell him we needed money to go into communities. And well, he didn't help us. And now that his wife had Parkinson's disease, he didn't know what to say. Mm. And he. He was shocked when he saw me. A twisted case of faith. <laughs> yes, and he said, you are a doctor. And then one of the, my nurses said, she's a specialist. And he said, really? And when I told him about the disease, he just started to apologize. He said, you remember me? You came to my office, and I pretended I didn't remember. And he said, no, I treated you very poorly, and I must um, say sorry for that. So you may never know in this life where you would meet somebody or where somebody will be useful to you and so sometimes if you cannot help you shouldn't be at least you should harsh be about it yeah? yes yeah. and so as we go through this life people are struggling and sometimes it's not just physical it's mm. mental okay. 
and we should be conscious of that fact. Okay. Omotola, um, I would want to find out how many people Parkinson's Africa has helped uh, because you say you support persons down um, home in Africa, your folks and all that. But I would want you, before you do that, I would want you to share with us your coping mechanism. How do you cope with this disease? I have a, I'm a glass half full type of person. I call myself a reckless optimist. And by that, I mean, I just I have decided to choose hope above every other thing. Um, and it's a strategy that I think, and it may be a strategy, a strategy and a mindset that I think has, has worked for me um, because Parkinson's is very, very, very difficult. Um, there are times when I cannot move parts of my body. There are times when I'm calm without the tremors and there are many times when, as you can see, they get worse and worse um, exacerbated. Um, but yeah, so I think my, my, my coping mechanism is just choosing hope above all else. Um, I don't remember the second question. Yes, how many people you've helped? Okay, in terms of Parkinson's Africa, um, I can give you numbers for the people that we're supporting with medication. Um, so through partnerships with organizations like the Fire Foundation and the World Parkinson's Program in Canada, we are supporting 200 Nigerian patients with access to free Parkinson's medication, low-income patients who ordinarily would not be able to afford their medication. I think in Ghana it's 75. Oh, wow, it's, it's, it's correcting me. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was 75, so we're, that's 100 patients in Ghana. In Uganda, it's 33 patients, and I think in, in Cameroon, it's, it's five patients. So I don't remember that math, but it's over 300, uh, 335 patients. And we hope to be able to support more people um, as, you know, the, the, the method that we're using is not really sustainable because we are buying, you know, the, we have, these drugs are being bought and paid for. So we're hoping to bring the relevant stakeholders together, mm. pharmaceutical company, industry, government agencies, uh, non-profit organizations, to find sustainable solutions mm. to this issue of access to medication for Parkinson's patients. Okay. So let's come to Dr. Obese. You also run the Inidatsu uh, Parkinson's Foundation. Tell us what you have done, um, what the challenges, and probably uh, you've already talked about things we must do to help, like giving you uh, platforms to speak. But tell us what you do, what you have done, and the challenge. So the foundation's goals, the goals we have is to raise the level of knowledge of every Ghanaian about new generative diseases, especially Parkinson's disease. Our goal is that every patient has access to medication. So we have partnerships like these where we try to get some of the medications free for patients who cannot afford it at all. And then How much is it? So the, a box should be around 300 CDs, but a patient, depending on the patient, some are taking three times a day, some are even on eight times a day dosing. And so if you are on a lot of a lot of that you are spending over a thousand CDs plus mm -hmm. what you spend on other medications for other illnesses mm -hmm. and um, one of the things we are passionate about is stimulating research we want stakeholders to be interested in researching because at the end of the day we can't keep giving medication at the end of the day we can't keep talking about um, a disease we know so little about yeah. and to be able to present numbers to be able to understand the disease we need people to share our passion or dream of research. Mm. And we, I, I can tell you we have a lot of clinicians ready to be supported to learn that. Mm. One of the things we do is also training of um, clinicians and health professionals to understand the disease. And so we've done trainings for the, the lower half of the country. At least we've trained more than 145 um, clinicians to understand the disease in different hospitals 
what we've also done is we've tried to train one nurse outside Ghana with some sponsorship to go and study what other Parkinson disease nurses are doing. So outside the country we have um, clinicians dedicated to the disease, so a Parkinson's disease nurse, a speech therapist who works with Parkinson's disease patients and all that. And that's our dream, that we'll have people collaborating with us both in, within Africa and outside Ghana and outside Africa to learn mm. so that we can send our clinicians outside to learn more and come and build capacity for ourselves in Ghana mm. here. And I think the last thing we also try as much as possible to do is to try and be a support for the patient. So we have support groups under us. They meet monthly. When you come to the support group meetings, we have patients and caregivers. We don't want only the patients to come. We want caregivers to come and understand the disease so that they can be a better support system for the patients. Mm -hmm. And so they meet monthly. Um, and that has helped the mental, I think, picture for our patients because you come, you see other patients who have the disease. The, if somebody lives close to you, you can visit them. They go for programs together. So it's a very vibrant support group um, that our patients have. And I think that, that has, over the past four years, been a source of emotional help for our patients. Mm, okay. We didn't even talk about, when we were talking about the treatment, we didn't talk about whether there are side effects to these medications and which could also result in other comorbidities. Yes, so um, these medications, these medications, depending on which one patients have, have very bad side effects. Some of the medications um, affect the thinking ability of the patient, that's the cognitive ability of the patient. So if they're already at risk of that, it worsens it. Some of these medications push patients into impulse disorders. So a patient, somebody who they didn't like women suddenly becomes promiscuous. Oh, or really? somebody, Yes, yeah, some of the group of medications we use. I see. Somebody becomes um, very addictive to alcohol or, or some things that they ordinarily would not, um, were not like that. Some of the medications cause a lot of sleep. So if the patient is working at a place which requires attention, they cannot focus. And I mean, generally, the medications, um, together with other drugs they take, the hypertensive drugs, diabetic drugs, and all that, there are lots of drug-drug interactions. Mm -hmm. And so that is why it's important that for us, we have a pharmacist on call. Even with the Parkinson's disease medication, um, you don't take it with um, food, directly with food, because it, it makes you more nauseous or you may want to vomit have a lot of abdominal discomfort, so we tell them to take it minutes before you eat, or if you've eaten, you take it 30 to one hour after you've eaten. Mm -hmm. And we counsel them to eat a lot of vegetables and raw fish so that they can have an easy, easier bowel and even protein diet, we have to advise you on that. Mm -hmm. So that is why I said managing patients, it's a teamwork, and the doctor cannot do that. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you all that. And so we refer you to everybody who is relevant in your care okay. to teach you that. Omotula, so what are your side effects? What are the side effects that you experience from the medications you take? I experienced a very difficult, um, I went through a very difficult period because of the side effects of a particular medication I was using. And okay. so they are called dopamine agonists, and that's the one um, Dr. Obese was talking about that causes impulse control uh, disorders. And for me, I don't know if I should say fortunately, it's something I can talk about. Mine was food, um, and particularly sugary, uh, sweet food. Um, and I, you know, shortly after I started, I got to a place where I was just eating compulsively. Um, whether I was hungry, I was not hungry, I could wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning and I was just eating compulsively. And of course, what this meant was I put on quite a bit of weight, in mentally that was difficult to deal with um, and eventually I had to tell my doctor that I wanted to stop the medication and then we phased me, they phased me out of the medication and then part two of the problem started which was I started to experience something called dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome and I didn't know this at the time um, but this was the period I was talking to you about going through a severe depressive 
um, episode. Um, I didn't know who I was. I didn't. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to participate in any activities. Sometimes I didn't even want to be here. Um, and it was very, very, very challenging. It was like an out-of-body experience, watching yourself and just trying to shake yourself out of it and not being able to. Um, if thankfully, a lot of that subsided. I had to go back on the medication because I was experiencing a lot of pain. But you know, these are things that you know we don't really talk about, and it's not really addressed. So uh, today we would have to apologize to our viewers that we couldn't allow them to uh, ask questions or contribute to the program as they usually do because of the change in location. So we do apologize for that. Let me come back to my guest here to tell us what they would want to see differently when it comes to the management of Parkinson's disease in Ghana, in parts of Africa, or the whole of the continent for the black race. Uh, let me start with you, Motola. You, because you, you want to see some improvement in the management of Parkinson's, you're running the foundation. What would you want to see differently in terms of policy, uh, uh, if probably more attention, governmental attention towards uh, Parkinson's disease or non clinical Tell us, what, what would you want to see differently? I think primarily the first thing for me is access to medication. That was one of the reasons I decided to establish Parkinson's Africa. Um, I think Parkinson's disease on its own, under the best set of circumstances, is very difficult to manage. When you now start adding the layers of stigma and you know not having medication, it becomes very very difficult. So I think the basic has to be, has the basic um, issue, which is access to medication, has to be sorted out so that you know people can at least have a chance at managing this illness properly. And then the second thing I would say is prioritizing mental health. Um, uh, and that, you know, like from, you know, from, the, from, from a charity's perspective, what I mean is, you know, we trying to raise more awareness about the mental health effects of Parkinson's disease because it's not seen and it's not really talked about, but it's more challenging than these tremors. You know, I've learned to deal with these tremors. You know, I don't know how to deal with my anxiety sometimes. You know, the thoughts that run through my head I cannot verbalize and vocalize them to other people because they will literally think I've lost my mind. But these are things that I deal with every day. You know, you see me, I'm smiling. You don't know the things that are going through my head every single day. It's like, you know, one attacking thought after an attacking thought, and I have to deal with it. So uh, the second thing would be prioritizing mental health, and I will allow Dr. Obese to talk more about it. Go ahead. Okay, so for us as a foundation, um, as I mentioned earlier, prioritizing um, non-communicable disease control, looking at it more from the policy perspective is crucial to us. We want to organizations like ours to be brought to the table to really tell the story of what it's like for those who experience these diseases and those who are the grassroots. And um, sometimes when we, we dictate policy, um, because those who are directly affected are not involved in the decisions, sometimes we formulate things that do, does not work for them. And so I think that that conversation should be there and we should be invited to the table. We pray and hope that the National Health Insurance will absorb the cost of their medications so that it's more, it's lighter for these patients and families in taking care of the patients. But apart from medications, they go through other treatment services. Yes. Are they catered for by the NHIS? No, please. Okay, so. No, okay. please. So we need that to be covered as well. And I also believe that um, in, in advocacy, going into communities and the rest, we need funding. And it's a lot of work. And we would wish that the Ministry of Health and the Ghana Health Service, they already have systems in place in disbursing information and if we can collaborate with them to use those already th those systems in place to drive the information to the villages and communities i think we'll see more patients coming out and having better access to care and we'd want an opportunity to train our clinicians 
in Parkinson's disease. All too soon, we run out of time already. We've been doing more than an hour of uh, conversation. But I, before I grant you the time to give us your final words and your thoughts, maybe you should talk about this uh, guide or this booklet that I have with me here. Uh, understanding Parkinson's disease an introductory guide uh, by Parkinson's Africa and IPDGC Africa tell us about it how people can have access to it is it free and then we proceed so this um, booklet is a health advocacy drive that Parkinson's Africa and um, being led by Motola and IPDGC Africa decided to work on and they printed this booklet so with their support and the support of Roche Ghana Limited, which also produces medication for these patients, the first 2,000 booklets were made free. And so it's available for disbursement in churches, in institutions. And so if need be, whoever wants some can contact us on Facebook. Our number is 054-1111-724. When you call us, we'll send some copies to you. We are happy to share this information and we are also calling on other stakeholders to sponsor more copies so that most people will have these booklets in hand which answers almost all the questions they may want to know about mm. the disease. Mm. Right. Omotara, let me help give you the opportunity to give us your final words. Um, the book is also available on parkinsonsafrica.com. You can download a PDF copy. My final words, um, first of all, thank you again for this opportunity. It has been a very wonderful, relaxed conversation. Um, I want people to, I, I, my philosophy or my belief is that in this life, like Vida said, we all go through challenges, we all go through difficulties, but I genuinely believe, and this is what has guided me throughout this journey is that there is opportunity in adversity all right so our mindset the way that we look at our adversity is what will determine the path that we end up taking so it is our mind i think i believe that our mindset will either be the light that guides us towards that opportunity or the darkness that blinds us from seeing it um, and I, I think, I, I also believe that there is power in pain and I have tried to utilize the power in the pain that I have experienced because Parkinson's has been very, very difficult, um, but it, it has, out of, out of the womb of my suffering, I think is where my strength was birthed and I want people to know that regardless of what challenges you are experiencing, there is hope and you can do great things in spite of it. Thank you, thank you so much uh, ladies for joining us. Indeed, I have learned so much from my two guests, especially Omotala. Uh, her final words has been that there's power in pain and there's also opportunity in adversity. Those are two powerful statements that anyone no matter what you're facing in life be it parkinson's or whatever neurological condition there is always opportunity in adversity and there is power in pain let's not lose hope thank you so much for your one hour shared with us my name is sarah Furi. see you same time another day